What's up guys, it's Ryan from Avatar Aquatics and welcome to the finishing or the second part of my Breeding a Mono Shrimp series. You guys have seen part one, it's been super popular, people have been asking me uh, all about what I've been doing, so this video is going to be a little bit longer than part one, however, uh, because it's longer, I'm able to tell you guys a lot more about the things that I've tried, the experiences that I've had, and also show you a lot more footage. So after watching this video, hopefully you guys will have enough information to feel a lot more confident about trying this out yourself. So in the beginning, let me just show you uh, this very, very nice video I took of a juvenile uh, Amano shrimp. So once they transform into the uh, sort of post larval stage, they're ready to go back into the freshwater and ready to get acclimated back into your tanks. Now, overall, getting to this stage takes a lot of time and a lot of careful, careful planning and careful um, sort of just overall thinking about what you need to do. So the goal of this video is to try to help you reach those conclusions yourself. A little bit about the resources that you guys might like to see. I have a lot more videos in my channel, so look on my profile for future videos once I release those. Um, anything from like phytoplankton's to the live streams that I've done. And also, um, there's not a lot of li uh, scientific articles lying around, but there are a couple. There's like one or two that I've uh, took, taken a look at. And so I'm also going to post the PDF versions uh, of those articles. So go ahead, look in the description below after this video if you guys would like to check out more. So one of the uh, sort of founding articles uh, of a mono shrimp larval breeding is this 1984 paper by uh, these two marine biologists from Japan, Hayashi and Hamano. And basically the finding from that was that these guys go through a very uh, long stage in salt water, um, requiring a lot of different types of food. And basically they're saying that, hey, uh, we sort of documented what these larval stages looked like. There are nine overall stages. And so with this paper, I found that um, the illustrations are great. Even if you don't want to read the entire article, you can go ahead and look at it. There are a couple of things that I've found to be uh, a little bit um, different from my own experiences, particularly the salinity at which these guys were raised, but we'll go into that in detail later. Uh, overall, this is a very good article for you to sort of you know, wet your hands and, and get, get your you know, gears in your head thinking about. A little bit of the introduction. Uh, the, the Amano shrimp, the scientific name is Caradina multidentata also Caradina japonica, and they're native to Japan and Taiwan. So over here, if you see this, this is Taiwan here, and Japan is a little bit to the northeast, uh, and these little colored places are where you can find them naturally. So over uh, a couple summers ago, I had the pleasure of going to Taiwan and actually seeing and finding the Amano shrimps in the wild in the streams. However, I think I titled that, I thought it, they were cherry shrimps, but uh, after looking through the view, uh, footage and getting a lot more experience, uh, they're actually, I'm pretty sure they're a type of Caradina, if not the Amano shrimp. And I do have that video on my uh, account or on my channel. So you can go ahead and look at it and see what things look like in the wild. Of course, everyone knows the Takashi Amano was the one that introduced it into the aquarium hobby and why the shrimp is now named the Amano shrimp. The really excellent algae eaters provided that you don't feed them more fish food than algae. So really, they only resort to eating algae if you only feed algae. So a little bit to you know think about that when you're trying to feed uh, your community tank. You might not get as much, uh, I guess, bang for your buck if your only reason for keeping the Amano shrimps was for the algae. They get pretty large uh, as an adult, around two inches or more, and they're really great escape artists. So if you don't have a lid on your tank, you might want to consider putting a lid on. They can climb out and uh, actually dry up on the floor. You'll find them the morning after. So the the most important thing about this presentation is the Amano shrimp has an amphidromous life cycle. That means that they travel from freshwater 
to salt water and back and forth um, throughout their life cycle and it's not particularly uh, for breeding so not, so different from something like salmon and usually the females will get buried they'll, they'll incubate their eggs and then they'll swim towards the mouth of the river still in a hundred percent fresh water and then let the larvae go and then at night the larvae will go ahead and float into the uh, estuaries the the bay or the deltas and into the ocean where they mature uh, molt and then come back as post larvae and swim back upriver during the night where they can avoid predators so this sort of life cycle i want to i want you guys to be thinking about that life cycle as we go through because some of the more interesting things like their attraction to light only happens when they're still larvae and then was or sorry zoas and as they sort of lose that attraction to light that's when they actually become post larvae because they really want to look for darkness as they travel back into the freshwater in order to avoid predators another reason why they're attracted to light is because of food right algae need light to survive and algae often have these uh, light sensing mechanisms that allow them to go up into the water column during the day photosynthesize right and during that time the larvae if they're also attracted to light they're almost always going to be in a place with food so over here this is a life cycle of commercially bred food uh, shrimp so it's very similar to the amano shrimp however the biggest difference is that the amano shrimp does not have this uh, nauplius stage so we go straight from egg to the zoeal phase and this is called the abbreviated uh, larval stage or the abbreviated larval cycle so we go from once the female uh, lays her eggs um, incubate them and hatch them out they go into the zoeal stage they'll go into um, a very very brief mysis stage and then straight into the post larvae so uh, but overall i think this is very important because since there's not a lot of a mono shrimp uh, resource out there you can actually look at these other types of shrimp that have been successfully aquacultured in a sort of commercial in a commercial sense and get a sense of you know what is it like to breed uh, different types of shrimp it's very very useful another thing is caridina typus typus is this sort of darker looking amano shrimp it's a beautiful shrimp but i've found that um, they've also been sold as amano shrimps in the hobby so if you are looking in the hobby stores or in the fish stores and you see this darker looking amano shrimp there's a possibility that it's a different species and while these guys have very similar life cycles very similar temperaments and they do like to eat algae at the same time they are different species and they might not like to breed um, together with the eggs on the caridina typus they're also called australian amano shrimps these babies will actually much rather prefer the bottom of the container which is a big problem especially if uh, you have sediments or fish uh, rotting fish flakes or food on the bottom so this species is a little bit more of a challenge to bring up and to raise and it also takes a lot longer to develop than the amano shrimp so they'll be spending a lot more time in the saltwater phase females really quickly i talked about this in part one but once again the biggest uh, uh telltale sign is going to be their sort of height and their rounded abdomen you can see how rounded this one is and if you buy a group of amano shrimps you're almost always going to get both males and females a lot of people talk about this stripe down the uh, side of them where compared to the males oops there it is compared to the males the males don't have that stripe and they're a lot thinner but another way of telling is if you ever breed uh, cherry shrimp or any sort of neocaridina colors you'll see that the females have this really large second segment on their abdomen over here and this is another telltale sign however uh, the thing i like to say is because the fish stores rarely sell mature mono shrimps your best bet is going to be getting a group and uh, going from there <laughs> one of the funny things is when i was buying my pears i spent about 
40 minutes at the fish store trying to figure out males and females before selecting two shrimps and these two shrimps ended up being um, correct now it ended up being correct the only thing uh, I want to talk about on this uh, actual stage here is the female reproductive cycle um, the from from molting to getting buried it usually happens within the same day if you have a saddled female and you could see this dark spot on the back of this female and that's the ovaries and that's where all the unfertilized eggs are kept and develop as they go through from being buried to drop it's a it's about 17 days however i found that you can actually take the eggs out about on day 14 and have a pretty good success rate um, you really have to look at your personal shrimps and to sort of log things out yourself in order to realize uh, when is it best to take the female out into her own hatching containers and when to leave her in because uh, every shrimp is a little bit different so if, if it's during the summer, the, from dropping the eggs to the next batch is going to take about a week. Um, you have to feed them really well during this time, and they really have to have both males and females in the tank constantly. So the total time of a reproductive cycle, the fastest time that I've sort of noticed is about 25 to 30 days. And notice that this is during the summer because over the winter, I've really realized that the Amato shrimps do not like to breed. Um, even if I have the heater turned up, if I have the light on like a 12 hour, 14 hour cycle, they just don't breed, even if I feed them well. Okay, so the rest of this presentation, you're gonna see a lot of microscope pictures. And if you don't have a microscope, that's totally fine. I, I'm going to put a link in the description to how to make your own DIY uh, phone plus laser pen microscope. And basically you're gonna need a, a laser point, pointer, some bobby pins for your hair, uh, and tape, and uh, a, a phone and scissors. So look for that in the description below. I'm not gonna get too much into it. During the buried phase, prepare some fresh seawater. If you aren't by the coast, Okay, that's not a problem. Don't worry about it. I'll get to you in a second. But if you have access to seawater, go ahead, get maybe two gallons, a gallon or two, and then just let it stay out in the sun. Now make sure the temperature is right. It's not going to get overheated. Um, and, and when I say in the sun, you really want to put it in the shade, but outside, because if you if you put it in 100% sunlight, it's probably going to get too hot and you're going to kill all the microorganisms and diatoms in the water. So during this time, a lot of people have asked me like, can I use freshwater algae? And my answer for that is, I've never had success with freshwater algae. However, other people might have, who knows? You're gonna have to test it out for yourself. My, 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 my sort of message for today is if you don't have this access to fresh seawater, go ahead, get yourself uh, the, the artificial mix, not a problem, and substitute the algae with phytoplankton. In fact, if you also want to do phytoplankton, phytoplankton has been the number one tool for me to keep the uh, babies alive for quite a long time. So phytoplankton is definitely one of the best foods, first foods out there. And then as they get through the latter half of their development in salt water, you can start adding a little bit more flake food and a lot of more like crushed powdery foods for them or other sources of protein. And I'll get to that in just a second. Over here, you guys will see the diatoms that I've grown outside in the sun. And you can see some ciliates over here, but mainly these are the diatoms that are gonna be feeding our Amano shrimps. Now, this is the phytoplankton that I was talking about. On the bigger side over here, these larger cells are tetracelmus. These guys can move around and they're perfectly modal and they're a little bit easier to culture compared to the uh, sort of smaller green dots. And these are the nanochloropsis. The, the pros of the nanochloropsis is that these guys can grow in a lot of different brackish, almost freshwater conditions, whereas the Teltrosomus really need about 24 parts per thousand or above to full strength 35 PPT water. And I've 
already made a phytoplankton video uh, that goes into detail on how to culture uh, the phytoplankton. So go ahead, look in the description for that video if you'd like to learn more. So when do I um, no, remember when to remove, let me actually see what that slide is, when to remove the mother. The exact same time really depends on your tank conditions, the female herself, and whether or not you're going to stress her out. Okay, But there are two things that you can look for to realize. Number one is, does the female have a saddle? If she does, it means that it's already probably been about a week or so since she becomes buried. So during this time, if she doesn't have a saddle, and this is not 100% because sometimes she'll lay the eggs and not want to lay a second clutch, right? But during this time, if you notice a saddle, it means that you know it's probably been a couple days already. You may do this earlier. You may do you may do this earlier if you notice that the mom is already dropping inside the community tank. That means the mom is ready, right? The second thing, which I'll get to in a second, is to look for the pinholes of the eye. Eye, eye little eye spots on the eggs, which is almost impossible to see. So really, you want to be looking at your mono shrimps every single day, looking for the buried females. And if you find a buried female, log the day, count 14 to 17 days, and remove her from then. When you remove the female mono shrimp, you put her into another container, which I'll show you in a second, and do not ever put the adults in a salt environment. Don't ever add salt in in with the uh, adult female. You only do this for the babies. Now, this video here, or this picture here, is actually of a, a monoshrimp egg that's one week in development. We can tell that it's not ready yet because you have this really large mass of yolk and the baby really needs to you know, sort of process almost all of the yolk before they're ready to come out. You can see the eye is already starting to develop. And uh, what I believe is happening right now is the head is on this section and they are curling towards us with the tail on this part. So the head is here, the body curls around and the uh, rest of the tail is right here. It's sort of like a 3D thing that you kind of have to look around. So on here we have much more developed eggs. You see the eyes here, the yolk is almost gone and the body curls around on this side. After she drops, um, you can go ahead, remove the female from the container and then put the babies in salt water. On my part one, I talked about a three to five minute uh, sort of acclimation. You don't really need to do that. You can go straight from fresh water into salt water for the babies and they'll be fine. Not a problem. Food, I will talk about this in just a moment. I just want you to start thinking about what you need to do. During this time, the aeration has to be pretty high. So the reason for that is as we are inducing the egg laying, the female will only lay her eggs once you put her in the container and she feels that there's a strong current because in nature, you know, the rain's coming down and, and the river's running and she wants to make sure that her babies will get washed out into the sea. So you need to induce her by doing a very high flow airline. You can do an airline or an airstone, it doesn't matter, but just make sure there's flow circulating through. Like I said before, the female likes to drop at night so there's less predators out there. What I usually do is, you know, put her in the container at around 5 p.m. Um, by about 1 a.m. in the morning, she's already done dropping. You don't have to stay up for this. You can let her stay in the container overnight, wake up in the morning, and remove her. Okay. If you realize that the female is not laying her eggs, and the next morning she's still there, which has not really ever happened to me, feed her a little bit, change the water, make sure the water is very clean, and then wait for another light. Once she's done laying her eggs, you want to remove her with your hands, not a net, because as you see in this video, there are all sorts of little eggs or little shrimp floating around. If you use a net, you're netting out your, your, your clutch, basically. And you can see that as the air, air is, uh, water is circulating through, she's actually using her hands and picking at the ends and physically allowing them to uh, out so she 
really assists this uh, sort of hatching process and the egg-laying process. And you'll also see that she already has the saddle. It's been about um, two weeks. So the newly hatched larvae, this is what they look like under the microscope. Once again, you don't really have to look for a microscope to breed the Amano shrimp, but it helps when I'm trying to teach you, right? We still have the yolk, but it's much less. You see the tail bending over on this side. The uh, eyes are over here. And as you'll see, um, these black dots are actually going to be visible um, on the f on, on, when they're under the female uh, in her abdomen, but you can very barely see it. You can see that it's still alive and all these other ones have not hatched out. If you realize that the female is laying her eggs and there's still eggs on the bottom, she'll usually drop all her eggs at the same time. But if you realize that there are unhatched eggs on the bottom, they're still alive and you can keep the unhatched eggs in the circulating containers for a couple more days and they'll usually hatch out pretty, pretty fast. You want to make sure you're going to use the same community tank water as the female, okay? Because once you're removing the female and putting her back in, you don't need to acclimate. You could just drop her back in because it's, she's, she was only there for a night or two. You don't really, have, it's the same water parameters. So this is my setup. Uh, I've changed a little bit of the, during this time, like I said before, uh, I go straight into the salt water. And this 10 gallon tank, the reason why I have everything in the 10 gallon is because I'll leave a heater here, fill it up, so it's sort of like a, a, a hot bath or like a sauna for this uh, here. And then I'll put another airline here to make sure that the water will circulate pretty well. I do have a filter in this tank. However, if I had um, more equipment or more money, I would go with a bigger container. So the bigger the container, the easier it is, up to maybe 2.5 to 5 gallons. You guys saw this in part one. This is the development phase um, of day one. And you'll see that they're very, very attracted to the, uh, the light and they swim sort of backwards. So the next four weeks, this is the new material, the food, growth, and water. Okay, Th those are the most important things, I would say, food and water. Let's talk about the different types of food you can feed your uh, shrimp. The first one, like talked about, Tetracelmus and Nanochloropsis phytoplankton. They're readily available if you look for them online. Uh, I know some of my viewers aren't uh, at, um, I guess, in the U.S. where we can basically order anything online. And my answer to that is if you can find a hobbyist who is doing saltwater uh, tanks, please, uh, you can ask them if they ever have, you know, salt water that they're changing out and try to grow algae from that. Um, the artificial foods, there's, what I'm going to do is go through every single one of them. So the phytoplankton, the pros is, I found that it, it is the number one best source of food for the very beginning fish or very beginning. They're always going to like the phytoplankton. It's people, there's a lot of information out there on growing and, and, and culturing phytoplankton because Earlier, like I said, um, people, people grow a lot of food shrimps. People farm these larger prawns and fish and shrimps, and it's used to feed the babies. They're easy to grow, and most like, and compared to the other foods, they will not pollute your water. In fact, they'll actually take a lot of the nutrients that the shrimps uh, sort of come out as waste, like the nitrogenous wastes, and they'll convert that into food and grow even more. So it's sort of like a self-sustaining food source. The cons is you need to know how to culture it. And I have a video of that in the description below. Don't worry. You need a little bit more effort than feeding flake food. You might have to set up another timer, a light, etc. Right? Uh, another air pump. And like I said before, maybe a little inaccessible or expensive, etc. Um, but Overall, if you if it, this is just your first time or second time, uh, this is going to be one of your best, uh, I guess, tools. Artificial foods. The pros is it's very nutritious. We have the complete nutrition nutrition profiles for a lot of these foods, 
It's easy to feed. Um, it's a wide variety. You can order pretty much any flake food out there, crush it up, or pellet food, crush it up, and sprinkle it on. I personally like to use the Hikari first bites, but it is no way um, the only choice. The cons is, and this is the biggest con out there of all, if there's one thing you learn about foods, this is it. The con is that the artificial foods will pollute your water very, very quickly. Anywhere between six hours to 12 hours to about four days after you feed it. If you feed too much, your water is toast and it's gonna be to the point where you start a bacterial bloom, they attack your shrimps, and then your entire clutch is gone in, in the blink of an eye. In just a couple hours, you can kill your entire clutch. So what you save in speed uh, compared to the phytoplankton ends up, you make up for it with water changes. Now, the artificial foods, like I said before, they are very nutritious. And so what you want to feed is just a tiny little speck, okay? Like uh, take a brush or something and then just brush it up and then just sprinkle it in the water. Do not have more than like, I'm, like if, if it's just a little bit, it is going to be great. Feed often, not more. The algae on containers, uh, I talked about growing algae for about two weeks. As you notice, the female is buried. It's free, easy to maintain. You grow a lot of different varieties. The cons is with supply. If it's not in the summer, you might not get as much algae as you need. It's super random. You don't know what species that you're growing. You don't know whether they're safe, if there's pathogens in the seawater or predators in the seawater. We don't know any of that. So pros and cons of each, just a little bit of information to help you decide for yourself what works and what doesn't work for you. And lastly, the microorganism. The pros is great source of protein and it just shows up in your tank over time. Uh, a lot of people have been thinking about like things like rotifers and the rotifers, if you get a culture online, you're gonna have to culture it yourself, but they eat the phytoplankton they incorporate the nutrients and then the fish or the shrimps as they get older they will predate on the rotifers another microorganism that people feed is yeast yeast has the same problem as artificial foods it will crash your tank if you add too much do not add too much yeast in fact i don't even use yeast anymore because it's very hard to get that ratio right the cons I already talked about polluting the water and also they use the same resources as the shrimp. So if the shrimps are eating phytoplankton, the rotifers and most likely the other organisms are grazing on the phytoplankton. And lastly, they're a little bit unreliable. A lot of times they uh, multiply much faster than the larval shrimp and so they'll overtake the colony, crash your tank. So pros and cons of each, my top two are going to be phytoplankton and feeding just a tiny amount of artificial food every single day and doing water changes every other day to ensure that my water is clean. Another thing is in my uh, first video, I talked about 24 hour light. After a long time, I realized that electricity ain't cheap, number one. There's competition from other sources of algae. So if you take a look at these sort of uh, longer duration ones, you'll notice that you have some red algae, some green algae, some brown algae, and the shrimp really only like the brown algae and they barely touch the red or the uh, green algae. Another thing is hormonal development is really important for shrimp. If you disrupt the normal day night cycle in larval development, we don't, I've never had a problem with it, but there might be uh, sort of yield problems or other types of problems down the line that we don't know about. We just, there's not enough uh, research out there. Obviously, it's probably the cheapest option if you're not looking to buy other things, but most of the time, the 24 hour light is not going to give you enough uh, shrimps after a while because we just don't, we can't grow enough algae. The Hayashi and Hamano solution is to do rice bran um, and a artificial fish food. Um, now, Hayashi Amano did this in lab conditions, very, very sterile environment under constant supervision. In the home aquarium, it's a little bit harder to do that, right? And uh, with the yolk, it's, it's going to, you're gonna run into the problem of um, pollution very, very easily. 
other considerations I talked about how it was very different from lab uh, conditions the water quality they, they did water changes every single day if you're not looking to do that don't do it um, but phytoplankton and uh, baby brine shrimp so baby brine shrimp is actually used in uh, commercial fish farming and shrimp farming because the commercial shrimps are obviously a little bit larger and they're able to predate on the baby brine shrimp I've found that very very late into the larval cycle for mono shrimps they are large enough to take baby brine shrimp live baby brine shrimp but we run into the problem of if you keep baby brine shrimp in your tank with the larvae they will take up a lot of nutrients they will take up a lot of not oxygen and they might overtake your quality and if you add too much baby brine shrimp they're going to die after a little bit they're going to settle to the bottom and ruin your water quality once again phytoplankton um, and a little bit of artificial foods pelleted or crushed up flakes perfect what to look for in the next couple of slides so now we get to the fun part the uh, microscope videos and pictures and I want to talk about these are the things that you want to be looking at the movement the feet the swimmerettes the color and the GI tract in the organs I'll try to point out what the point of each slide is but overall take a look at all of these things in the next couple of pictures day one development we see that we have the yolk uh, very well um, still there the GI tract isn't very developed you can barely see it and this is actually sort of the fetal position I guess and this is what they look like inside the egg this is what the shrimp look like as they are uh, sort of swimming around in the water and they actually go tail first when they swim so they use these thoracic legs to sort of push the water in front of them and so their direction would be this fit this shrimp would actually swim to the uh, right in stage one the biggest two things that you're looking for if you have a microscope is this sunken uh, in eyes you know like crabs have their eyes coming out of their head in stage one of these shrimps they're actually sunken in and that's you know to keep themselves as small as possible in the eggs and another thing is if you look at the hairs on their tails you'll be able to uh, count seven pairs on each or seven seven little hairs on each side for a total of 14 so one two three four five six seven one two three four and five is actually behind here six seven so 14 overall in stage one I guess here's another look at the sunken in eyes in stage one 4.5 days and really this is this starts on the second day the mono shrimps start eating and you can see for yourself that this is their GI tract it's very very full and because we don't know uh, when exactly these shrimp finish developing their GI tract it's important to have the phytoplankton inside the tank as you drop the shrimps in so whenever they're ready they can start eating this is still stage one the fecal material uh, I found the fecal material and I you know actually took pictures of the shrimp sh with the shrimp poop um, you can see it's basically all algae at this point there's nothing else that they're eating and this is in a phytoplankton uh, batch so stage one and two um, the difference between stage one and two the biggest difference is the eyes so if you look at the needle or where this one is pointing the eyes have now become much more rounded pops out the head compared to the first stage here where they are still sort of sunken in and in line with the rest of the head so those are the two biggest differences if you have a microscope this is probably going to take anywhere from five to seven days stage two we talked about the hairs on the on the sort of um, the hairs on the tail and now they have oops and now they have 16 overall eight on each side so one two three four five six seven eight same thing on the other side you're going to notice a difference between these two shrimps and that's because this one is in stage three they have these extra little fins on the top or on the sides and these are the exapods 
I'm gonna let you guys there we go and as you can see these little green dots here are the phytoplankton it's the tetracelmus now usually they transition from stage two to three at about day seven to ten and there's another stage three coming into the frame here you can really tell based on the leg or the tails or was it europods no it was exopods they're exopods and endopods that's my bad okay so stage two and three let's see stocked eyes so we talked about stage two having the stocked eyes in stage three same thing you have these eyes popping out so it doesn't change after that Now, stage three, Europods, once again, the tails, you can see, have these extra fins. And if you look very carefully, you can see another set starting to develop. So that's in stage three. And at this point, I stopped counting the number of hairs because look at that. It's very, very hard to see. So one week into development, you have something that looks like this. This has the yolk is almost gone now. It's starting to develop into the gut. You can see the heartbeat, and you can see sort of the gills. Oh, the heartbeat is over here. That's my bad. And you can see the gills over here, and they are breathing very well. Now, at this stage, I start feeding the flake food or the artificial food. I don't actually drop a flake in there, I grind it up into very, very small pieces and then uh, I go ahead and put that in. Because of your artificial food, you need to do more water changes every two days. Uh, you can change about 20% of the water. Make sure the bottom is clean because the, if you don't have a clean bottom, your, fit, your, your shrimps are going to fall to the bottom. They're gonna get attacked by all the bacteria that's eating the dead algae or the dead uh, fish and exoskeletons. And at that stage, they're gonna die. So another thing is as these shrimp molt, they go on the bottom, they molt, and it's very, very dangerous as they come out and they don't have a good shell yet, right? <laughs> Development, um, so the next couple of weeks, um, about, about seven more days after the first week, they start going from, the, of, you know, you're not gonna notice a lot of growth in size from the first week. They're more of growing their organ systems, right? But as you get into the second week, you're gonna notice a very, very fast um, transition from you know a tiny shrimp to much larger shrimps. And so at this stage, um, they start taking different foods. It's a, it's a fascinating topic. I, I, I love this. Uh, project it's been so great to see okay so 12 days I wanted to show you a little bit about uh, the things that I'm doing right now so you'll see that I have these couple of um, containers on the side that's growing phytoplankton I have the heater in here I have the babies on this side and basically as I hold the light to it and the filter is here the water is very very green let me see if I can skip forward okay and then that to see how the babies are coming out of the actual water or column and following the light very very cool these are all stage three or more 14 days they're still very very much alive in the water um, at this point I want you to ensure that your bottom is clean right and just a fascinating fascinating life cycle they're still swimming backwards by the way okay so now we have almost two weeks in from two weeks onwards we have the sixth larval stage and this stage is characterized by these little dots under the abdomen and if you can take a guess of what they are 
they are the swimmerets. So the swimmerets start to develop. They're still swimming backwards, but they're almost getting ready. Oops. And you can see that the tail has many more flaps. It'll be two on the outside, two in the middle, and then one uh, big one in the center. And that center one goes from being a wide sort of uh, fin like that into a very, very thin or rectangular size. It is a beautiful, beautiful color at this point. The more orange they are, the more well-fed they are. So go ahead and use that as a way to gauge how well you're feeding your shrimps. So the ninth larval stage, at this point they are one stage away from transitioning into the uh, fresh water and you can see that their swimmerets are very, very, very well developed. They're still swimming backwards, but you can see that they look much more like an Amano shrimp than when we first started out. They're very, very orange and overall um, the legs on their on the, on their center or their front legs are still they still have these little hairs on the tips and as they transition into juveniles these tips will now become walking legs with little pincers at the front. So first juvenile stage a little bit over 20 days you might figure out um, you know this is when they start morphing out into juveniles and you'll really have these different um, shrimp morphing out from 20 days onwards to 30 to 40. So they don't always go at the same time. Um, however, if you feed them really well, they can um, morph out a little bit sooner than 20 days. So you want to be ready for them a lot, a lot, um, a lot earlier. So at this stage, this is the one that's morphed out. There are more shrimps floating around. And you see at this point, they have these little curl to them. And this is how they swim around. They still swim backwards. They're still attracted to light, but um, they are much more, they're much larger and they're very different from the very beginning when we put them into the tank. And see how fast it swims at this stage. I do have a video of just two minutes of a post-larval metamorphed shrimp swimming around. So if you have trouble trying to figure out, you know, what does it actually look like? Go ahead, uh, down description below, I have a link to that. So this is when I start to acclimate them back into fresh water. I'm gonna go ahead and put them in a little container and you're gonna drip acclimate. And I have a slide on that in just a moment. And you'll see that they're swimming forward now, uh, very, very fast and much different than the uh, actual ninth stage larvae. Okay, so this is what I found. I found the molt that it had molted out of into the juvenile in the tank. This is it under the microscope. And then over here is the actual juvenile. You can see that it's swimming very, very fast. I can barely keep it in the frame. And also it's using its swimmerets to beat the water and move forward. And it looks just like an adult except miniaturized. So this is what you're really looking for as the shrimp molts out and you're ready to acclimate. But look at the colors on this shrimp. I had no idea that a shrimp was this colorful when I first started out. And people say Amano shrimps have a dull color, but look at that. That is a beautiful, beautiful shrimp right there. Okay, so here's another video. Um, sometimes you're going to notice that the shrimps turn very clear. Other times they're going to look like this where, you know, they still have that orange hue. And it really depends on the shrimp itself. You can see the heart and this video, you can see that the legs don't have those hairs at the tips anymore. They have these little thin little walking sticks. Here's my acclimation guide. People out there have had success dropping straight into the salt or fresh water, doing 50% water changes, but I have not, okay? Do not do 50% water changes every day and just dump or increase the fresh water in. That will stress out your shrimp very, very hard and they might die. Do not do that. You have to drip acclimate, okay? Drip acclimate is your answer. And what I do is I do a continuous drip, okay? So I go from 100 mils of salt water from the rearing tank in a, in a cup, and then I'll go ahead, drop the baby in or the juvenile in, and then I'll drip acclimate for about 12 to, 14, to 24 hours, 
and I'll drip and increase the fresh water ratio up to until the water is about less than five parts per thousand. And at that point, you can put the uh, shrimp back into the freshwater aquarium. Make sure there are no fish in there. Other predators will eat a juvenile shrimp and you're probably not gonna see it for a very long time, just like the baby Neocaridina. Give them plenty of hiding spaces, feed them well, you can use flake food at this point, and uh, you're basically done with breeding at this stage. The water quality, last, last couple of slides, the last thing I wanna talk about is water quality. The larger the tank, the easier it is on your water quality. I recommend 25, uh, 2.5 to 5 gallon tanks. 2.5 is, you know, probably if I had ideal conditions, that would be what I would use. You want to water change every two to four days, depending on how much, how many shrimps you have, what you're feeding. And dead shrimp, exoskeletons, and algae will settle at the bottom, as well as newly molted shrimp. And that's very, very important because if you have bacteria in the very bottom, they will get attacked. Well, you'll, you'll, you'll see this under the microscope in just a second, but they'll actually have problems with molting, right? So please make sure you keep the bottom of your tank clean. That's done through siphoning, water changes. You can change them into a new container if you have to. And also just make sure that you do not do the same problems that I ran into in the very beginning. The molting issues you'll see, these are actually dead shrimp under the microscope and you'll see that their shells, when they're trying to molt, is still stuck on them or they are getting attacked by bacteria. So you'll see these little growths or these things attached to the shrimp. And this is the bacteria that I was talking about. You want to more or less keep your shrimp free of these little growths on the side. And you can see here's part of its shell it didn't molt out of. This can happen if you have bad water quality or if you're not feeding well enough, you're not feeding correctly. 17 versus 35 parts per, parts per thousand. You're gonna find people with success on both ends. Some people swear by brackish water, like 14, 17, 18 parts per thousand. Other people can only have success in 35 parts per thousand. My recommendation is to split your tank into two sides, one with 17, one with 35. I've known more people with 35 parts per thousand success than 17. And uh, there was one of my viewers who did this exact experiment and it turned out that the 35 parts per thousand developed normally, in fact, they were a lot faster. And then the 17 parts per thousand took a lot longer to morph out of the, uh, you know, the zoal stage, zoal stage. And the longer they are in the salt water, the more problems you can run into. Lastly, these are just my water parameters of the community tank just to you know let you guys know what's going on with the adults and how I'm keeping the adults in the fresh water and, and the juveniles in the fresh water. And lastly, if you have any questions, feel free to leave it in the comment below. There are a couple people who's asked these certain questions that I've answered in the part one, so you're more than welcome to scroll through. And uh, hopefully I've tried to answer most of these questions, if not all of them. So thank you guys so much for sticking with me through this entire presentation. I know it was long, but I look forward to seeing all of your experiments. And if you want, you're more than welcome to email me in the description. I have my avataraquatics at gmail.com. Email me with pictures, questions, anything you want. I'm happy to answer them for you.